to be here. Uh, the cold is not bothering you too much. And I think we're spoilt in uh, Richards Bay. And uh, that we tend to feel a little cold when it does come. And uh, bless the children uh, as they go as well. And, but a very, very warm welcome, special welcome uh, to you uh, this morning. My text this morning is going to be from uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 to 17. Hebrews 12, verses 14 to 17. Um, if you go to the preceding verses, but just to give you some context this morning, uh, it speaks about how God disciplines us uh, and trains us uh, as his children. In fact, it says, all children of God, those born again by the Spirit of God, will be trained, they will be disciplined and corrected. And the Word says we mustn't despise that correction or that discipline because the Lord does that because he loves us, uh, because he has a future for us. And if he didn't do that, we would be, in fact, illegitimate children uh, the word actually says it uses a stronger word, but we wouldn't really be his children at all. But all of his children, without exception. And the word continues the admonishment in verse 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 15 says, looking diligently lest any man fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any immoral and profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know how that afterwards, uh, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place... Uh, for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now the Lord bless his word to us and open up the eyes of our understanding this morning. Uh, we live in a world full of information, uh, but not with much transformation. Information is important. Uh, the uh, word of God, the information that God has left for us is life-giving but it will only bring transformation when we apply it to our lives. And so I want to encourage us with that uh, this morning. To give a background, and I want to focus on Esau and Jacob uh, this morning. Um, if we have a look at Genesis 25, 26, 27 onwards, the story moves to the children, uh, the two sons of Isaac and Rebekah, who were Jacob and Esau. And after being barren for some time, um, Isaac prayed for Rebekah and she uh, bore two twins. And, and she, there was a wrestling, the Bible says, in her womb. And she prayed about it. And God said, two nations are in your womb. And the older shall serve the younger uh, some take that as an idea of predestination, but it's not. It's speaking about nations that uh, Jacob and Esau, which later became Edom, would represent uh, in that regard. Uh, but what actually happened is, as the boys grew, the twins grew, uh, it said, first of all, that Esau, he was a hairy man, a hairy baby as well, and they called him Esau, which means hairy. He came out first, and uh, Jacob was holding on to his ankle. And it must have been quite a, a sight, <laughs> an amazing thing to see. And Jacob came out holding on to uh, Esau's uh, ankle, and they were both born. And um, Jacob was called Jacob, which actually means heel grabber. Uh, heel grabber, and some people also say supplanter. Okay, heel grabber. That's what the word Jacob actually means. And, uh, but as I grew, uh, Esau, the Bible tells us, became a hunter. He loved the fields, became a skillful hunter, the Bible says, and would hunt game 
and also make it for his father. And the Bible says that Esau was a favorite of his father. And that ought not to be, but nevertheless it was. But it says that Jacob was a quiet man and also a smooth man. He wasn't hairy like Esau. And he dwelt among the tents and he was his mother's favorite. And so Rebecca, maybe it was because of the prophecy. I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. And, uh, but anyway, one day Esau came in and he hadn't caught much or hadn't killed any game and he was famished and hungry and uh, Jacob was cooking a nice stew and he smelled it and like a red stew of different lentils and so forth the Bible says and he asked for some and Jacob we find as we go along he's quite a probably would be a very good businessman these days um, and quite crafty in a way and uh, he said to Esau um, Look, uh, I'll give you some of my food, or this, this stew, uh, but you need to sell me your birthright. Uh, you need to sell me the birthright because the birthright, and I'll explain in a moment or two, naturally fell upon uh, Esau as the firstborn as it was at that time. And um, anyway, Esau said, well, what is that to me? Uh, what is this birthright to me? And I'm, I'm desperately hungry now. And he actually agreed uh, to sell his birthright and uh, had some of the meal, uh, the Bible says. And in the course of time, the Bible says that uh, Isaac grew old and his eyes became very dim, so much so that he was, it appears that he was almost totally blind. And he knew that his time wasn't long anymore and he felt that he was going to soon be with his people and he wanted to pray the blessing and he uh, sent Esau out into the field and I want you to picture this a little uh, today, this account and he said, go and hunt some venison for me and make me a stew as you always do my favorite and Rebecca uh, heard what was going on so remember they also stayed in tents those days and she heard everything and uh, anyway, she hatched a plan uh, and she got hold of her son Jacob and said, Listen, uh, your father is about to bestow the blessing. It was the blessing of the firstborn, the birthright upon Esau. Now, come quickly, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to cook some stew of venison as your father loves, and I want you to take it to him uh, that he can give you the, the blessing of the birthright. And, um, uh, Jacob protested and he said, but look, you know, my father, uh, what if he finds out, he's going to consider me a deceiver and he's going to curse me instead of bless me. And uh, Rebecca said, don't worry about it. And she gave him some of Esau's clothes. He gave him some uh, animal hair, goat's hair to put on his arms to make him hairy. And nevertheless, long story short, uh, Isaac wasn't too sure, but after he felt, smelt the clothes, he smelt the food, um, and he felt the hair and said, this is Esau. And nevertheless, he bestowed the, the blessing of the birthright upon Jacob. And the Bible says, no sooner was Jacob had he left, that Esau came in, and he had come into his father and asked for the blessing and realized what had actually happened and began to weep and cry. But Isaac said, look, uh, you know, I've been deceived <laughs> in this case, but uh, what I've spoken, I've spoken. You see, God knows what we speak of, and as we, last week we've done the heart of man, he sees the heart. And while Jacob did not have the right means of doing things, he had a desire for the things of God. And it's interesting that the majority of messages I've heard about Jacob and Esau tend to hone in on Jacob that he was a deceiver. Interestingly enough, the Bible never says, God never says that Jacob is a deceiver. And you can go check the scriptures out as well. In fact, um, and the, the picture is often painted about Jacob that he, he was a bad guy. Uh, you know, um, 
the Bible, however, and we've got to, like we've just read over here, we, we've got to take the judgment. Scripture interprets Scripture. The Bible, in fact, paints Jacob as someone who was desperate, who is someone who sought the blessing and the things of God, while it always paints or portrays Esau, as we've just read, a disobedient and immoral and a profane person, and we'll explain in a moment or two what that means. Um, I don't hear many messages among, about Esau, but it's important when considering the scriptures that they are both negative examples of what we need to avoid and warnings on how not to do things. And God does that in his mercy because he doesn't want us to make the same bad choices as some of his people did in times past. In fact, if we read 1 Corinthians uh, 10, I'm not going to go there, but it speaks about how all of these people are examples to us. There are good examples and there are bad examples, but nevertheless, all scripture is given for our admonition, for our instruction, for correction, for warning, for reproof, and for encouragement, uh, the Word of God says. So I want to share, I want to focus more on Esau uh, this morning and ask the question, just think of it a moment. Uh, there are two twins, they're growing up in the same godly home, I'm not saying a perfect home, but they're growing up in a godly home with godly parents. Uh, parents who were the patriarchs and chosen by God and who, to whom the promises of God to multiply and to bless them had rested upon. But yet, two sons, they were the same age, they had everything equal. In fact, Esau had a natural advantage, if you could put it that way. But yet they turned out to be so different. If you're joining on the podcast this morning, I want to welcome you also. They turned out to be very, very different. And the question is why? Why did they turn out to be so different? Why did Jacob go on to inherit the birthright? And maybe it seems like human schemes involved, but God knows, and God sees the heart, and God will give the blessing uh, to the right person at the right time. And that's very, very important. And that was even prophetically uh, spoken at the time. So why? Why did Esau turn out so different from Jacob? And if we can grasp a very simple truth this morning, but a profound one, uh, that can help us in the own, our own walk of the Lord. So let's have a look at this uh, today. Um, I've entitled the message, and the answer to that is choices. Choices. The choices you make, make you. Can I say that again? The choices I make, make me. The choices you make, make you. Can we say amen to that? The choices we make, we actually become a product of the decisions that we take. We make daily decisions, we make bigger decisions at certain points in our lives, but the decisions and the choices we make, the Bible says, is vital and can determine our destiny. Uh, both year after, when we hear the gospel and we ministered the gospel last week in terms of the heart of man, we have a choice to make. <laughs> we can either accept Christ and accept his sacrifice for our sin, or we can continue in our sin, and that will determine our destiny, the Bible says. Either heaven with God or eternal torment and punishment, either eternal reward. That's based on a choice, our choice. The choices we make in life will lead some to success, even though all things be equal, and some to failure, and some to disappointment, and some to regret, like we see with Esau, and we've just read that passage and explained it over here. So the choices you make, make you. I want to have a look at a few things, some of the bad choices that Esau made that led to this place. Uh, God doesn't, there's no favoritism with God. Right in the beginning of time, uh, the first two children, Ab uh, Cain and Abel, we find this there that God was pleased and accepted Abel's sacrifice in Genesis, right in the beginning, uh, sons of Adam and Eve. And uh, God saw 
that Cain's disposition, his face, he looked miserable. <laughs> he wasn't happy. And God, of course, knew, but asked him, why are you so downcast? And long story short, uh, Cain felt that God had favoritism. But God said to him, if you do the right thing, will you not be accepted? If you choose the right thing. We don't have all the details, but Abel had chosen the right thing. But Cain had chosen a wrong thing. The Bible teaches us. Will you not be accepted? But if you do not, know something that sin lays at your door. And we see the same thing over here. So let's have a look at this this morning. Firstly is Esau, the Bible says, despised his birthright. Now, the birthright at that time speaks about the authority. So the first son God had commanded, every firstborn son uh, is to have authority over the family and just recognize that this wasn't the immediate family, this was the whole extended family as well, and would receive a double blessing. Not that the other children wouldn't receive a blessing, but he would receive a double portion. And the other members of the family would have to submit to this patriarch or this head of the family. In today's term, the birthright, and that's why we find it in the New Testament, God is speaking to us as his people, not to despise the birthright. You see, Christ has bought our birthright with his blood, not with food, with his blood. He has paid the price and given us a birthright which makes us children of God. Heirs of the Father and joint heirs with the Son. It is a, a wonderful privilege. So instead of being destined to, to death and eternal condemnation, we now have the birthright bought by Jesus Christ that gives us the opportunity of life. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called children of God, the Word teaches us. We are the children, and if we have the Spirit within us, as the Bible teaches us, our Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The very Spirit of God dwells within us as His children. So the birthright speaks of our authority our salvation, and all the blessings that we have as the children of God. Tragically, and I've seen many, despise the birthright. Number one, they start playing or interested in the things of this world. Uh, number two, the passion for the things of God. And that's what we see in op opposite to Esau, is that Jacob had a passion for the things of God. He wanted to do anything, and he was willing to do anything. He was willing to risk the wrath of his father. <laughs> uh, he was willing to lay his life on the line. He was willing to forego a quick meal. Uh, he had his sight on the greater thing. And sadly, sometimes, and let us guard against this. This is why the word is saying, let us guard against these things and not become, it's speaking to children of God, people of God, not become like Esau, in fact, the Bible says you count the, the blood of Christ as a common thing. The call of God, that high call of God, let us never despise it. Let us be utmost and the, the, the highest priority in our lives. Secondly, this morning we see, and they're, they're all similar, is he sacrificed the ultimate for the immediate. There was a moment of temptation, uh, but yet he chose to to be gratified immediately. And young people, if you're waiting for a right marriage partner and you're in tempting situations, or all of us, let us not sacrifice the ultimate for immediate an immediate fix, whatever it is. Whatever it is, the Bible speaks. But that's exactly what Esau uh, did. He living, lived rather to satisfy, the Bible says, his carnal lusts, his present cravings instead of cherishing the things of God. I always tell our young people at the school as well, the teenagers especially, I always say that lust can't wait to get, but love can wait to have. Love can wait to have, but lust, if people are making demands on you and trying to coerce you and trying to abuse you to do something, uh, that is lust. You see, true love can wait to have it can write for the right time and let us be mindful of that this morning thirdly we see that he disobeyed god's clear commandments in terms of 
the choice of life. He no doubt knew that very well as the people of God, that God had forbade, God had forbidden for the Israelites, for his people to take children of those who worship idols, of those who practice all sorts of evil things, of those who were sexually immoral and idol worshippers and, and all of that. He forbid it. Now the Bible does record that many of those did repent and join Israel. We need to understand that. Okay, then they certainly could. Uh, but those who were heathen, and the Bible says that Esau disobeyed God's command and secondly disobeyed his parents as well. Uh, he took wives of the Hittites, the Bible says, that God had specifically forbidden that they take wives of. Uh, the Bible says, Paul says the same thing, the apostle to believers. He says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't be, especially in, it can be in a business decision. Uh, the context was marriage. I mean, uh, the, that is the most important. And I've seen it all. You, you know, people, I'm talking about Christians. I'm not talking about if you're unsaved and the one becomes saved and the other one, the, the, there is teaching about that. We don't have to leave that person. The, the Bible's not saying. But if we as the children of God, the Bible warns, don't take an unbeliever. Because you don't know if you're going to save that person. And that's unequally yoked. Now, a yoke, and you still get yokes today, it speaks about uh, a yoke of oxen mainly. It's a wooden yoke that forces the two oxen to be tied together uh, at the neck. And they walk and they normally plow the field. And you still get it today. It's an ancient thing, but it's still, you'll find it still today. Uh, there's this wooden yoke. Uh, the one on the one ox and the other one on the other ox and they will walk together. Now if there was an unequal yoke, uh, these oxen, uh, you'd maybe try to put a donkey with that oxen, you're going to have a problem, or uh, uh, a different, an unevenly matched one, there would actually be a chafing because they wouldn't work, walk together and there would be bleeding. And that's exactly like it is when we make decisions to become unequally yoked. It might seem good to start with. But down the line, it causes a lot of pain, and I've seen it over and over again. It can be a business partner as well. Uh, it can be an unequally, they've got different values to you. Down the line, they want to do different things in different ways that is going to go against your principles. And I've seen that as well. So let us be mindful of these things. But Esau, in that, also dishonored his parents. In fact, there's a very sad verse that says, uh, at the, right at the end of Genesis 26, he says, because Esau had chosen, made this life choice of taking these women, these idolaters, uh, and these sexually immoral people and so forth, it says it caused his parents, Isaac and Rebekah, much grief. And that is true. Uh, the decisions of our children even if we raise them in the right way, if they make those decisions, it causes tremendous grief to the parent. And we need to understand that uh, as well as the people of God. Again, I'm not talking about non-Christians. Uh, I'm not talking about people who don't believe. They're going to do all sorts of things and make all sorts of decisions and they can get absolutely saved. But I'm talking about when people are saved over here, and this is what Esau knew as a child of God, what this entailed. Furthermore, the Bible says he was a profane and sexually immoral man. That Esau was profane. What does it mean to be profane? It's a very specific word. It means treating holy things as common or with contempt. It's characterized by irreverence or contempt for God or the sacred principle of things. It means not devoted to holy or religious purposes it means unconsecrated, secular, or opposed to sacred. Even those who despise the gathering of the saints, who just te treat the gathering of the saints as a common thing, that any other thing can be put in its place, are actually practicing profanity. profanity. Who treat the blood of Jesus just as a common thing. Oh, I can if I want to, and I won't if I don't want to. I can... You just do you. You know, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible calls on us to love one another, to be there for one another. Now, I understand that people work sometimes. I'm not saying that. And people have 
might go away. But I'm talking that the Bible says if we make a habit of that, we're actually entering the realm of profanity. Uh, just like you saw, the things of God is just a common thing. And yeah, this is not a feel-good message, but it's a Bible message. And we need to understand that this morning. And the Bible says it for us. He, he was also sexually immoral, the Bible says. And as I conclude this morning on Esau, and I want to mention a few things about uh, Jacob to finish off with, he had a, a victim mentality. When he found out that, uh, and this was some time later, uh, that Jacob uh, had taken his birthright, he cried big tears and blamed Jacob. And these two times he has deceived me. Uh, but the Bible doesn't say that. It says that Esau despised his birthright. It wasn't Jacob. It was Esau who despised his birthright, and God gave it, therefore, to one more deserving. But he had a victim mentality. Now, one of the things, uh, when I travel around, and sometimes I'm staying here or there, and even as a young person, I like every now and again just going on the streets and ministering to Atties. <laughs> Hobos, call them what you want to, and I'll sometimes just walk around and, and share the gospel with them. I've noticed a common trait, however, and I don't condemn them because sometimes they've just landed up that way for whatever reason. Choices. <laughs> okay? But there's a victim mentality. It's always someone else what someone, because if you get, you get to grips with them and question them and what is the story, why, you'll find there's always someone else that is a problem that they're blaming and they're not actually taking responsibility for their own lives. That is actually, and we see Esau, he, he didn't take responsibility. To him, he was the victim of a year. He's been robbed. But no, Esau, you sacrificed your birthright for a moment of pleasure, the Bible says. So the Bible clearly lays the responsibility at Esau's door. And this was already done some time before all this. And I've made the comment over here, you either see yourself as a victor in Christ or as a victim of your circumstances. But we can change it. We can change it. And that's why the Word of God speaks to us as His children. Remember the context of correction. If we see these things in our lives, we can change it going forward. And we don't have to be a victim of our circumstances. We can choose and make good choices to become successful. Finally concerning Esau is Esau was a too little, too late man. I'll say that again, I'm using uh, common English here. Esau was, in inverted commas, a too little, too late. He tried to later on cry, the Bible says. He had big tears, <laughs> uh, begging his father, but it was too little, too late. The thing had been done. I've made the comment here is that, in fact, he, he lived to dearly regret his decisions. The Bible says, first begging his father for the blessing of the birthright. He then hatched a plan to kill his brother. Later, trying to, uh, following that, he tried to correct his bad marriage decisions uh, by choosing to marry more wives of Ishmael's daughter, recognizing that his parents were displeased about the whole thing. But it was too little, too late. I've made a comment over here is that some opportunities, listen folks, some opportunities, if we don't make that choice there and then, they are forever gone. One of the big ones, and I can give you one or two examples this morning, is uh, I get to do funerals as a pastor over the years, now and again. And it's always sad to see and to find out that children or relatives who have never done anything good to the person, and sometimes even bad to the person while they're alive, want to now bring flowers. And I always remind the congregation, I say, give flowers while the person is alive. Be a blessing to them while they are alive. And yes, it might be a good sentiment to bring nice flowers at the funeral, and, but it's far better to give flowers while the person is alive. And I get really annoyed because I know people sometimes who have treated a person terribly, uh, children who have been disobedient, 
And yet on Facebook, when the birthday comes, we're in loving memory of dear mother, but they were a rotter. <laughs> they were disobedient. <laughs> and no amount of flowers and lovely words is going to change that, f that opportunity. Folks, the Bible says us that we can make these good decisions. Let's love. Let's love tangibly. Let's be here for one another. Not in abstentia. <laughs> Let us be here. And the body of Christ is called to be together. That's what the word of God says. Don't give flowers too late. Marriage decisions. Now again, I'm not talking about unbelievers, because unbelievers can be saved regardless of whether they're married or un. If they truly come to Christ and repent, God will forgive them and is able to remake that vessel. But if we know the truth, uh, those decisions, once you make them, are not easy to get out of and very, very painful. I know. I've said it's amazing. You sit with people and you can counsel them and yet they make that decision and come back later and lives a terrible mess. You know, you don't say, well, I told you so, but I'm just saying, you know, this is what the, the word says. Training your children. Folks, we have a window of opportunity. The Bible says train a child while they're young. Teach them while they're young, that when they're old, they're not going to depart from the principles. I was saying the other day when we were doing a devotion with the teachers is that uh, children, and I always tell parents as, as well, children hear more with their eyes than with their ears. Can I say that again? Children hear more with their eyes by what they see. They look at the parents' ex uh, example, and as they grow up, uh, like that little duck, that is born, that little chicken. Uh, the first thing he sees is, is the mother, <laughs> the, the mother duck, and you follow, and, and he's going to follow the mother's example. In fact, you get some ducks, they're amazing. Uh, geese, they, they lay their eggs on high, high cliffs, and they jump down because they've got to go feed after a while, and the little ducks actually follow the moms. And these things are amazing, and I've, I've watched it on a, a, a National Geographic. Some of them actually go, I'm talking about high mountains, they actually literally bounce off the cliffs. And incredibly, some of them survive. <laughs> and they end up falling in the snow. One or two don't. But the thing is, they follow mom. If mom's going to jump, I'm going to jump. Okay? Parents, uh, children of God, we have but a limited opportunity to set an example. And I've seen many, they get lax about things, lax in the example and the things of God, casual about it, treating it common, and later on the child goes wayward, and now they want the child in their faith, and the child rejects the faith and wants nothing to do with the parents. And I pray, you know, and God does have mercy sometimes. And he does always have mercy, but I'm saying, uh, in fact, I think I made a quote over here, it was Frederick Douglass. He says, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Frederick Douglass, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Now Jesus can repair broken men and he does that, but I'm just saying, let us choose wisdom up front. So Esau was a too little, too late man. Another example about opportunities is open doors or call to a certain ministry. Open doors. If God is calling you into something at a certain time, if you miss it, it can be missed. <laughs> but just like Esau despised his birthright at that certain time and couldn't get it back again. There are certain times. I know in my own call to pastoral ministry, I was in different types of ministry many, many years before that. Uh, but God, there was a time when God specifically said, I'm calling you to step out of what you're in now and step into a full-time ministry, and I'll provide for you, and it'll take, and he always has. And it wasn't an easy thing. But I also felt in my spirit, if I had disobeyed at that time, that opportunity would not happen again. It would not come again. Whatever it is, whatever it is God is saying, be sensitive to the spirit. Don't be a too little, too late person. Jacob, as I conclude... He made choices in obedience to God's word if we have a look at his life. Even though he had reservations, he obeyed his mother. 
He, he obeyed his mother. He was in submissive to his parents. Later on when his mother sent him to go get a wife of their own people to travel and go stay by her brother Laban for a season, he, he went obediently. He was an obedient man. Jacob did not have a profession of love with an absence of love for his people. Many Christians have a profession of love for God, but there is no real love for the people of God. And that, the Bible says, is deception. It's incompatible. How can we say we love God if we don't love our brother? I'm not talking about just lip service here. But I'm talking about tangible love. And Esau was such a man, but Jacob loved. He was a man of love. Be holy. I've made the comment here that the real you is the one when no one is looking. Let us not be sexually immoral. And I know as a school, and not only our school, but many schools have got big, big challenges with things on social media, pornography, and all of these things. And we need to pray for our children. Uh, we need to give them the Word of God. But there's all of these things out there. And when no one else can see, God sees. He sees our heart. He sees the things that we do. Let us be pure before Him. The real you is the one when no one is looking. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, the word says, acceptable and holy in his sight. Not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. And as I conclude, esteem the high call above all. And if we sum up uh, uh, Jacob's life, we have that beautiful story where he met the angel fleeing from his brother uh, using his own means to gain things that come to an end. He had come to an end of his own self and had to now learn to lean on God. And the Bible says there was a man, an angel that wrestled with, with Jacob. You could imagine there was a fight going on. And the angel said after some time, let me go, I need to go now. And Jacob held on and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Folks, friends, family of God, that's the passion we need. That's the desperation we need. You see, the choices of God are not easy choices. It's very often to make the choices of the world. Jesus said it's a broad road. It's an easy road. Uh, but the road to life is a difficult path, but it's the only one that leads to life. Don't always choose the easy thing. Choose the good thing. Choose the God thing. And I want to encourage us with that this morning. But Jacob said, I will not let you go. I will not let you go until you bless me. Let us press in. Let us press on uh, to the things of God. Let us count that high call above everything, even our very lives. As I conclude this morning in speaking about the choices you make, make you, I just want to say it's not too late. Uh, there might not be, I don't believe there's unbelievers yet. But if you're an unbeliever, you can make the choice of salvation to receive Christ as your personal Savior before it's too late. You can make that decision today because that's going to determine your destiny, the Bible says, as a Christian. If we've made bad decisions, if we've made bad choices, as we all do sometimes, but we can say, God, just remake the clay. Remake the vessel and God is able to do that. He's able to give us other opportunities. There might be some opportunities that we miss, but it's not too late. We can call upon the name of the Lord, and going forward, we can choose to make good choices. Choose, and I want to come in from a different angle as I conclude. Choose to let God make your choices for you. I'll say that again. Choose to let God make your choices for you. You see, God has given us a free will. But he also says there's consequences to the choices that we do make. But the only sure way to success, I'm talking about God's success, what God determines is prosperous and sex successful is to let God make your choices. How do we do that? God has given us his word. Make your choices, whether on a daily basis, whether it's concerning relationships you keep, 
uh, whether it's a job, whatever it is, certainly marriage partner, what, whatever it is, choose to always stay and walk within the Word of God. That's why the Lord Jesus, in a pre-appearance to Joshua, said, you want to be prosperous, you want to be successful, walk according to all the law of the Lord. Speak it, declare it, don't move to the left, don't move to the right. And then you're going to become successful, then you're going to become prosperous. Fear not, do not be discouraged. Folks, I want to invite you and encourage you, there's much to make us discouraged. There's much to make us feel hopeless today in the world. But you know what? We have a bright hope and a bright future. We can absolutely have success as we walk according to the Word of God. There is direction and guidance for every area of our lives. And let us just stick to us. There's so many opinions these days. Everyone has an opinion about something. Even Christians these days have opinions about the Bible, what it says and what it doesn't. Now, the Word of God is sure. It's not subject to private interpretation. It says what it says. It says it plainly. It says it clearly. How can we make the choices of God by the Word of God? Be led by the Spirit. The sons of God are, be, are led by the Spirit. Okay, something, you've got a warning in your spirit about something, don't go there. Pray about it and ask God to lead you by His peace. And then there's the open doors. Allow God to open doors for you. Uh, but sometimes you need to wait. You need to be patient. The Lord bless you. I want to leave you with that this morning. Let us bow our heads. Father, we thank you today. Lord, that we can be reminded. Thank you that in your mercy, you've left us examples, Father, of how not to do things and examples to follow. And all is in your mercy because you want us as your children to do well. You desire to give us a hope and a future, your word says. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning. I pray for your blessing upon each one today. Upon each one this morning. Upon each listener this morning. Father, may we be mindful of our daily choices. Lord, we have the choice to walk in joy, to have a good attitude. We have the choice to be ready to give an answer to someone who asks us a question concerning the gospel. Lord, we have the choice to be able to love someone, to give flowers while we can. Lord, we have the choice of commitment to be willing to lay down our lives, our own desires, Lord, and to pick up our cross and follow you, knowing that you lead us to life, knowing that you've gone to prepare a place for us. So I pray for each one this morning. And Father, we thank you for your word today. We give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Lord bless you. To invite the worship team up. And uh, may I ask Damon and Moses to just come and assist with the offering. If you brought something. We want to give you an opportunity to give.